crash course. I think the way you can think of my presentation is it's basically a homework assignment that you should probably do if you're working uh, in any uh, broker-dealer um, capacity uh, in, in the equities world or the options world for that matter or futures. So um, this is kind of a cheat sheet on how not to get involved in the things that um, you know at this point in time are probably not the, the right way to make money in the market. So the thing that actually heated it up is Michael Lewis's Flash Boys. Okay, I don't like the book. I'm heavily critical of it. But it, what it did was take an insider uh, market structure debate and reform conflict and exploded it on the national uh, stage. So you have all these uh, in, uh, regulatory bodies just jumping uh, to do really damage control on a major uh, public confidence issue that... Uh, you know, for better or worse, Mike Lewis uh, basically ignited. But I think of it as, you know, he's the straw that broke the camel's back there. Uh, that also gave confidence to very, very large class action lawsuit firms to pursue cases that probably, probably could have pursued five years beforehand. What I like to do is frame what we call this crisis. What's it really about? How did it erupt? Why do people care? Market structure is, you know, in the, five years ago... Um, I had an investor who told me, I can't listen to this stuff. It's so boring. And it is. Okay, a lot of algorithmic trading, it sounds great on the outside, but you're really basically going through you know, hundreds of pages of regulatory filings and technical guides trying to find little edges. And it's very tedious work. Uh, it, and I should also point out, it is not quantitative work. That's like a very strange kind of um, misinterpretation, I guess, of, of what really what high frequency trading is. It is not the kind of activity that large quantitative trading firms do. It is more of a technology, market structure oriented activity. But here's the frame here, okay? The market structure crisis is a non-transparent national market system where professional traders have an advantage over institutional investors, okay? And what are those um, edges or that, that, un that unlevel playing field? Preferential market access, Superior fee structure for the, for the smart guys, uh, preferential access to order flow, and preferential order types. The order type controversy is pretty much synonymous with you know, my name in terms of um, uh, the heat on exchanges to disclose how their order types operate. Now, um, that's half of the story. The other half is, is really a market reform issue. So the, the first issue, you know, the first class of behavior is, is really we have certain players and for-profit commercial interests that have created asymmetry in the market. And that's what I fight. Okay, the other issue is the more general problem of market fragmentation and the unintended consequences of regulation. So what you have, and, and there's a very important year to under, in terms of automated trading and understanding what's happened with market structure in 2007, uh, a whole framework for restructuring the uh, U.S. national market system called Reg NMS was rolled out, and exchanges had to implement a ton of technology. Many of the special order types I criticized were actually rolled out under the you know, pretense of complying with regulation NMS, but I would argue they came with certain uh, features that were uh, preferential. So this is a, an issue really about the unintended consequences of, of regulation and how different players in the market um, interact with the technology, uh, you know, leverage regulation. What I, call, I, what I call regulatory arbitrage here is, you know, I'm, I'm famous for a, um, basically for a, a preferential treatment of orders that were allowed to jump ahead of the queue within exchanges. Now, if you go into the details, that behavior is basically permitted because of an obscure rule that probably no one here knows called Rule 610 of Regulation NMS. And guess what? You're I mean, every major HFT out there knows those rules cold, knows the impact of those rules on their business, and basically, you know, requested of the exchanges and, uh, to allow them features to uh, 
get better treatment with these rules that they didn't really like, okay? So, so the, the problem here is that's not really illegal. That's a market reform issue. And there's a huge difference between securities fraud, discriminatory treatment, and unintended consequences of regulation. And the market structure crisis had both those, you know, those two domains are basically went head on and, and, and kind of, you know, exploded with this Flash Boys uh, revelation. Um, so moving on here, this, the, the, another angle here to understand here is that the system that we're talking about where, where, where you can either be a winner or a loser, and that's what it comes down to, uh, is co composed of 11 stock exchanges, more than 40 dark pools, which are basically you know, pseudo exchanges where you can trade but they can't show prices because of regulation, and then hundreds of broker-dealer internalizers. And the navigation of all the different rules and structures uh, you know, different exchanges compete against each other with different market models. Uh, dark pools do the same, and they're in a different class. Dark pools compete against exchanges. Broker-dealer internalizers try to shuffle order flow away from the, what we call the lit market and dark market. That is, you know, also, I would argue, an unintended consequence of regulation. Uh, the SEC created rules that incentivize the creation of all these different venues. Um, and what does it really come down to is it comes down to a number of industry practices that are under siege now. And these are, are, are the practices. So I'm not arguing that payment for order flow arrangements are illegal. Some people want to see that completely banned. I'm actually pretty neutral about these things. I get very interested when one particular firm gets some kind of advantage or edge with, you know, with these types of practices that harms another party in a way that breaks security laws. So what can you do? Um, you know, these are basically the areas that you, uh, these are areas of regulatory commercial pressure, but they're also basically areas that if you're in a broker-dealer, you, you need to master, okay? We are not in an age where if you don't understand code or how systems work, that you can sit on the sideline while a high-frequency trading client or, you know, or a trading firm that's operating overseas conducts what we call latency arbitrage in your systems. You are responsible, right? Uh, you're, let's say you're Series uh, 7 or uh, Series 24. You know, you, you, these registrations are tied to the behavior of, of algorithm trading and responsibility for algorithm trading in the systems. Actually, what's happening right now is, is there's a movement among regulators to force programmers to get registered and have more direct responsibility for this stuff. Okay, so moving on here on my last slide. Uh, this, this is basically your cheat sheet. For, I, I mean, your cheat sheet for the issues that you need to learn was before, but this is basically how, how to get through this, this uh, very interesting period. Um, it's basically just a few... Uh, rules of thumb here, okay? One thing is to understand, and it's, it's amazing watching people over the last four years not understand this and then have their lives destroyed because they don't understand this, is that widespread industry practices, and think LIBOR, think all the things you've seen hit the headlines, right, are under siege. That means that the practices that me and a hundred people know about and we think are fine, may not be fine. And this is from a, a, a case uh, in 1998 where it says even a universal industry practice may still be fraudulent. Okay, this is one year where the, you know, someone's saying, no, the regulators are not going to do something about this. It's too big. You know, this has been going on too long. That's, that's not the right advice if, if you're asking about, like, is it okay if I do this, okay? Now, I'm going to move down here because of time here, but I want to basically get straight to uh, the seniority reporting line issue, okay? I, right now, am involved, as I said, in a lot of um, whistleblowing activity with regulators. Uh, I assist other whistleblowers who, uh, for one reason or another, need assistance, and I bring their information to regulators. And I find myself working with very, very senior people and very, very junior people. And I've seen in my own practice very, very junior people come in and just do what their boss said 
and they're just in, you know, they got the wrong job in the wrong place in the wrong time, and their lives are destroyed because of all that regulatory heat. The number of active investigations, way, way larger, you know, of open active investigations in market structures, way larger than that that was closed. So I'm basically going to say this, is you can't actually rely on your boss. That's all I want everybody here to understand. You cannot rely on your boss. Okay, you have to have some concept and some view upon behaviors. Many of the ways that we get an edge in the market, and, you know, again, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a capitalist, right? There are winners and losers. And there's edges that are permissible, and there are edges that are impermissible. And, that, and the impermissible ones are the ones that you should care about. So, you know, we say, it's gaming isn't necessarily illegal, but here it is. If it doesn't smell right, leave. I'm not encouraging you guys to report to be a whistleblower, but if you find yourself doing some type of function in the organization where you're capturing an edge, and I'm speaking like an algo guy here, and it just doesn't smell right, right, it, ethically, right, you probably shouldn't, you know, yes, you could escalate it and all that. That usually doesn't get rewarded within these organizations. Um, there's, there's really no reason to stick in the seat. Your best defense is having your own view of right and wrong and saying, I don't want to be involved in this. And hell, you know, if you're good, there are other places out there that want you. Right? Thanks.